This morning's scripture is found in John 7, verse 32 to 52. You can find that in your Bibles, on the overhead, or um, I believe in the YouTube link. Um, Before we begin, I'm just going to open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, um, yeah, in need of your word, and uh, I pray that, yeah, that as uh, Pastor Albert preaches through um, this, these verses in John, that, yeah, that you would use him and that you would uh, soften our hearts and open up our hearts to, um, yeah, hear what you want us to hear, and that we would go out here uh, changed, um, yeah, uh, and to, to love others in our neighborhoods this week. In, in your name we pray, amen. Starting at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I, where I am you cannot come? On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those, be- whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is, this, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers said, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. This is the word of our Lord. There are many different views of what people think about Jesus. You could go uh, all around in your daily life and you could ask people, who do you think Jesus is? What do you think he's about? And you'll hear a variety of different answers. And I think one of the most important things that anybody could do if they are going to really think about who Jesus is, is to actually go to the source, to listen to Jesus himself, not to take someone else's word for it, but to actually go to the source. And one of the ways you can do that is by reading a firsthand account of Jesus' life like this one we're reading today. This is part of the Gospel of John, uh, written by one of Jesus' disciples named John, and it's recording what Jesus has said and done in his life. And in the passage we're looking at today, we have this really interesting situation that's happening. Jesus has been uh, interacting with the people in different ways. He has quietly gone up to this Jewish festival that's a week long. And in the middle of the week, he begins to talk. And as people begin to talk about Jesus and think about what he's really all about, and they begin to argue, is he this special person or not? And we'll look at this all today. The Jewish religious leaders get upset. And they're so upset with Jesus. They're so disappointed with what he's saying. They're so angry about what Jesus is saying that they send soldiers from the temple to arrest him. And the soldiers, after spending some time, we see at the beginning of our passage, after spending some time listening to Jesus over some course of time, we're not sure how long, they return in verse 45 to the Jewish religious leaders empty-handed. And when asked why they came back without arresting Jesus, why didn't you do your job? This is what they said in verse 46. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. That's not 
really a, a, an adequate answer for a soldier to give after being given an order. You're told, go arrest this person, and you come back and you say, no one ever talked like him. No one ever spoke like this man. They, they couldn't bring themselves to arrest Jesus because they heard Jesus speak. And what's intriguing to me about the story, if you've never read this before, is I think if, if you were actually listening to this happen, that the soldiers really, they're gonna lose their jobs most likely for not doing what they're told to do. They're not Roman soldiers where they would lose their lives in this moment. Most likely they would lose their job, which means they lose their livelihood, which means that they lose the ability to provide for their families. Their lives would take a massive turn here because of this action of not arresting Jesus. And they're not willing to do it. And their only excuse is, no one ever talked like this man. And you would think that would make the people who sent them think twice about why they responded this way. You would think that it might be logical in verse 46 after hearing that they responded this way is that the religious leaders would say, well, what did he say? What was it so mesmerizing about what he said that caused you not to arrest him? Like, I don't understand how you guys could not come back with Jesus. Did he bewitch you? Did he curse you? Did he do this? What did he say that caused you to be so unwilling to arrest him? But the religious leaders don't ask that question. They don't even seem to be interested in that question. They seem to have missed that entirely. They're just wanting to put Jesus to a trial and then really to death. And I think this is a, a pause for us right now in this passage to really, in a sense, jump into the spot that the religious leaders didn't bother, and that is ask ourselves this question. What did Jesus say that caused these soldiers to be so mesmerized by him, so in awe of him, so amazed by him that they couldn't arrest him, they wouldn't do their duty and risk their very lives, in a sense, through it and because of it? And that's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to actually take you through what Jesus says so that we could get some understanding of what it is that caused these soldiers to be so amazed by him. And then as we hear it, do some heart work in our own lives as we listen to this and ask ourselves what kind of response to what Jesus says is in our own hearts right now. Are we like the, the crowd that's being described here? Are we like the soldiers who are being described in this passage? Or are we like the religious leaders? Where do we fit? How do we respond after we hear what Jesus has to say? And so I'm going to lead you through the passage that way, asking the first question, what did Jesus say? What was it that mesmerized these soldiers so much? And then second, how do we respond? Do we respond like the people in the story? How do they respond? How do we respond? And then finally, a final question for us, and that is, do we really know who we are? Do we really know who we are? All right, first, what did Jesus say? All right, in fairness to these people, it's a little difficult at first to understand what Jesus is talking about when he says in verse 33 these words. Have a look at it. He says, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Now, in, in fairness, the, the people listening, the crowd listening in verse 35 and 36 are confused. And they're asking each other questions. What's Jesus talking about? Is he saying that he's going to go somewhere we can't follow? Is he going to go to the Greco-Roman world and speak to the non-Jewish people? Is he going to go to the Jews who are dispersed around the, Greek, uh, the Roman Empire? Is that what he's doing? Is he going on some worldwide mission trip? What's Jesus talking about? That he's going to only be here a little while longer and then he's going to be gone. He's going back to the one who sent him. We don't get it. Now, thankfully, when you read something like this, you can read the entire Gospel of John, and we're not going to do that in this moment, but I encourage you to do it, because Jesus uses these very same words in chapters 13 and chapter 14 and in chapter 16 again, and in every situation, he begins to uncover more and more of what he's saying, and basically, he's saying this, I'm only going to be here a little bit longer before I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. But after I suffer and die, I'm going to rise again from the dead. I'm going to go back to the one who, is, who sent me and I'm going to send into heaven as the king. And I'm going to send my spirit after I've done this. And Jesus is basically saying to them here in this crowd, crowd moment and later on to his disciples in chapters 13, 14, and 16 that he's saying, but you can't come with me on this part of the journey. You can't come with me to the cross. You can't come with me to the tomb. You can't come with me to the resurrection I'm going to experience in this moment. This is something I have to do and I'm going to do in a sense alone. 
But in fairness, the people there weren't really understanding it. Now, what else does Jesus say? Because that would have maybe left the soldiers confused. But listen to what he says next in verses 37 to 39. He says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stands up and says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, the first part, somebody offering a drink, you're like, okay, that's no big deal. But when you get to the second verse, verse 38, whoever believes in me, says Jesus, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now Jesus is saying something that has caught probably everybody's attention. Because most likely what he's referring to here when he talks about the scriptures, talking about rivers of living water, is he's probably talking about Ezekiel 47. And in Ezekiel 47, this Old Testament prophecy that Jesus would have known, in that prophecy it says that there will come a day when out of the temple of God, a river will begin to flow. And as it flows further and further away, it gets deeper and deeper, which is rather strange if you think about it. But everywhere this water goes, it brings new life. And everywhere this river goes, not only is the new life just suddenly growing, but it's growing in places that it's never grown before, like the desert, all the way to the Dead Sea, in which there is no living thing. And it says this river flowing from the temple, this river of living water will bring life to the desert and life to the Dead Sea. It will swarm with fish. There will be trees and plants on all sides of this river. This will be a work of God, a miraculous work of new life being done. And now Jesus is saying that he's come to give people drink. And that drink, he's saying, is actually the living water from Ezekiel 47. Now, John helps us understand this a little bit in verse 39, where John says, Now Jesus said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, what what John is helping us understand here in this passage is he's saying, Jesus is standing before the people and he's saying, I am the one who's come from God. I'm the one who will die for the sins of the people who put their faith and trust in him. That Jesus says he will suffer and he will die alone. He will be put in a grave, but he will rise again from the dead. And he will ascend into heaven and he will send his spirit. And the spirit who comes is the spirit of God himself, the personal God, the spirit of God. And that spirit will work in people's hearts and lives to give them new life, just like that living water in the Old Testament picture from Ezekiel 47. And that new life will well up in them and come out of their hearts and make them brand new people. Totally changed. So much so that they will be characterized as people who have new life in them. But just like that living water in the Old Testament picture came out of the temple and gave new life to everything else around it, these new people will have new life in them and that new life will work out of them and bring life to the people around them. This is what Jesus is saying he's come to do. This is what he is all about. And what he's really saying is, For us today, as we think about this, if you really want to understand what Christianity at its heart is all about, here is the good news. There's a God who sees us in all of our sinfulness and all the ways that we are not loving him or loving others the way we ought to. And rather than leave us to be condemned as we deserve, he sends his son, Jesus. And Jesus, knowing us to the very core of who we are, willingly comes and says that he will suffer and die in our place, suffering alone, a place we cannot come. But because we put our faith and trust in him, we are united to Jesus in such a way that you're united to him in his death. That means in a sense, your sin dies with Jesus as he dies for it. But then not only are you dead with him in that sense, you are then raised with him because you're united to him and you're a new person given new life. And then he sends his spirit to create in you this new life that causes you to actually be changed inside so that you are filled with the spirit, so that you are living a new kind of life that's characterized by what the Bible calls the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That this is beginning to be what's characterized by your life if you're a Christian, and all of it's a work of God by his grace, by his spirit, that makes you a new person. You see, Christianity isn't some 
believe some stuff, believe some ideas, and then you have a new knowledge that you can use and you can make happen and you can sort of manipulate to do what you wanted to do in your life. No, no, no. Christianity at its heart is brand new life, new spiritual life from going spiritually dead to spiritually alive, that there's a river of living water, the spirit of God dwelling in you, changing you from the inside out and making you a person who brings new life to those around you. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. This is the reality of what he's talking about. And this is why I believe the soldiers go back to the religious leaders and say, no one talks like this guy. No one talks like this. The religious leaders didn't, the Pharisees didn't, the Sadducees didn't, none of the people of that day, no one talked like Jesus. No one described a person himself like this or no one would ever dare claim to have this kind of authority and power that Jesus is describing here, that he could give new life to people like this. And so this is why Jesus, after he says these things, I believe the soldiers come back and they're just like, no one ever spoke like this man. But the question I think that we have to deal with is if this is really what Christianity is, if this is what new life is in Christ, and if this is what Jesus is saying, how do you properly respond to this? And in our passage, we really see four different kinds of responses. There's two responses by the crowd, two different ones. There's a response from the soldiers and there was a response from the religious leaders. And I'd like to look at them with you now to see what they are and then maybe where we fit, where you and I fit in this response. Okay, first the crowd. In verses 40 to 44, we we meet the crowd. This is the large group of people that are there for this Jewish festival. And as they're there, they heard Jesus say these things. And some of them, it says in verse 40, some of them, they say they believe. They say this really is the prophet, verse, end of verse 40, verse 41. Others say this is the Christ, but then others disagree. You see, what's happening here is that some of them are starting to believe it. Some of them are starting to really understand it. And they're saying, this Jesus must be the prophet. And that's describing an Old Testament person that Moses described already uh, millennia before this. And he's saying, Moses is saying, there will come a person who will speak on God's behalf in a way that I never could. Someone greater than me, says Moses, and he will tell you all about who God is and what it means to follow God and to trust God and to live for him. Listen to that prophet who is to come. And these people are starting to say, maybe that's Jesus. Maybe he is that prophet. And others are saying, maybe he's the Christ. Maybe he really is the Messiah, this anointed king who was to come to bring new life and new prosperity and peace to the people. And so they're starting to believe it. They're starting to believe it. And and some of them might have even heard Jesus a while before this describe himself this way as he does in Luke chapter 4. Because in Luke chapter four, it says this, that Jesus goes to the synagogue in in Capernaum and he sits down and they hand him the, the, the scroll of Isaiah and he unrolls it to Isaiah 61 and he quotes verses one and two, which say this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus sits down and they're waiting for him to explain his interpretation of this passage that he's just read. And what does he say to them? Today in your presence, this passage has been fulfilled. They, he, J- Jesus is saying, I'm the guy. This is talking about me. I'm the one who's come to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm the one who's come to proclaim freedom to the captive. I'm the one who's actually come to free the people who are oppressed. I'm gonna bring sight to the blind. I'm gonna heal people. I'm gonna restore life. I'm gonna bring new life. This is Jesus' mission. This is who he is. He is the promised king, the promised Messiah, the promised Christ, all mean the same. And so some of them, some of them believe it. Some of them are believing it. They're like, this, this could be him. This is the one. And maybe you're here today and maybe that's you. That if you were, you were here today and you're listening to this, you're like, yes, that's Jesus. He is the king. He is the Messiah. And I would say, awesome. Praise God. That's awesome. I'm so excited for that. But I would ask you to, to think about this. Jesus is not saying all these things and doing all these things for people simply to give intellectual 
assent or to just say, yes, I believe in these things about Jesus in the sense that, yes, okay, I can agree with them. What Jesus is saying, if we really do believe in him in this passage, is that one of the evidences of it, one of the ways that it actually ought to be working itself out, and it might start small, but it needs to be a reality of your life to some degree, and that is there should be living waters flowing out of your heart. That if you really say you believe in Jesus, and your life looks like almost everybody else's life all around you, there's something really off. If there's very little evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm not saying that, that you don't have bad times or you don't, make, uh, you don't sin, you don't do hard things. No, no, no. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, but if there's no evidence of some kind of spiritual new life and spiritual growth that's happening, then you might just be intellectually believing in Jesus, but not really believing in Jesus. And this is an important thing to think about. Because you don't just want to give intellectual assent to Jesus. That's not enough. A real Christian has had the Spirit of God change him or her from the inside out, a new heart, and out of that heart flows living waters that give new life to you, but also to the people around you. And people will see that love, that joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control evident in your life. Not just one. And I know this isn't this sermon to, to go through the fruit of the Spirit. You can find it in Galatians chapter 5. But the reality is sometimes we, we tend to look at a list like that. Well, well I'm a patient person, and, and, I can, and, I, and I can be self-controlled. I'm not that gracious or loving maybe, but, but those things are true. So I'm okay. Or, or I'm actually really loving and gracious, but I lack patience. But, you know, that's okay. At least I got a few. I'm faithful. And one of the things that the writer, Apostle Paul, in Galatians 5 does on purpose is he says, this is the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. By nature, we can have some of these things naturally in our dispositions at times. Some of us can be naturally patient or naturally loving, if we might put it that way. But this fruit of the Spirit is saying these are the characteristics as a whole that characterize who we are in an increasing measure because the Spirit is working in and through us. And so my encouragement would be that if we really are believing in Jesus as the true King, the true Messiah, the true prophet, then our lives should be characterized by the Spirit's work in us and through us, bringing new life to us and bringing life to the people around us because of how we live that life. Now, there's others in the crowd, and they clearly aren't believing. They're not even seemingly wanting to some degree to believe, but they're struggling, and that's found in verses 42 and following, where at the end of story, verse 41 and following, it says, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture talked about him coming from Bethlehem? Now, these are interesting people. They know their Bibles, Okay. I think you have to understand that these are not a bunch of people who have no idea what the Bible says. They know their Bibles because they wouldn't have brought this up if they didn't. And they're saying, how could Jesus be the Christ when he comes from Galilee? The Christ is supposed to be born, the Savior who's supposed to come. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. He's one of the, this David's descendants. How can he be born in Galilee? Jesus can't be the guy. Now, the sad part about this kind of group of people is that right in front of them, they had the opportunity to ask Jesus himself, where are you from? And they just assumed they knew. Now, in fairness to them, okay, well, let's that, not be harsh. Most people in that day grew up where they were born. You didn't grow up and then move somewhere and then move another place and travel all around the world. Very, 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 very few people ever did that. Normally, no one moved from where they grew up. And so they assumed because Jesus was living in Galilee as an adult, he must have been born there. But they don't ask him. They don't, they don't pause to investigate. They don't, they don't say, well, Jesus, are you, from Gal are you from Galilee or were you born somewhere else? Were you born in Bethlehem? It's not like Jesus would have lied to them. He wasn't trying to send them astray, but they don't even ask. They don't even, they don't even look into it. And I think this is an interesting thing to sort of challenge ourselves in, and that is sometimes we can think about Jesus and we can talk about Jesus to a certain degree, but we hit certain hurdles or we hit certain things in our life and we're like, oh, I'm not sure I really like that about what Jesus is saying, or I'm not sure I like that about who Jesus is. And let me see if I can find some kind of escape hatch. 
Let me see if I can find something that I don't like or that maybe doesn't match up with, with my view or what I like to see about Jesus. And so I'm going to just use that as a escape hatch. I'm not going to really investigate it or ask much about it, but I'm going to use it as a way to avoid Jesus and his claims. And my caution to you today is if that's maybe striking home for you, that you're like, yeah, I know about Jesus, but I, I kind of keep him at a distance because I'm not sure about this, about what he says or about this part of what he's like. I don't really like this part. So I'm not going to really listen to all that Jesus says. I'm going to sort of pick and choose. Then you're behaving like these people in the crowd. And the reality is you're never going to get the real Jesus. And you're not going to have a heart that's going to be changed by that Jesus that you pick and choose from. You're never going to have a personal close relationship with him. You're never going to experience his love when you keep him at a distance. Now the soldiers, their third group that we meet here, and the soldiers, I, I really like the soldiers in this passage. Maybe you can tell already. I like these guys because to some degree, they're just mesmerized. They're amazed by Jesus. And it goes against their character, so to speak. It goes against their, their, their right thinking, their logical thinking to, to care for themselves or to make sure they're caring for their families. I mean, they are risking their livelihood and everything by not arresting Jesus. But they clearly have been listening to him to a degree that they can't bring themselves to do their duty. And if you ever have, if any of you have ever been a soldier or you've known people who are soldiers, there's one thing that's drilled into you if you're a soldier. And what is that? You follow orders. If you do not follow orders, people die. And it's true. So for a soldier to ignore orders and to come back, I mean, they don't come back with this excuse and say, Jesus evaded us. He, he slipped out a back door. He, he, uh, he gave us the slip. You know, we, we, we tried our best to arrest him, but people got in the way or the crowd started to object and they started getting away and everything else. No, they have no excuses at all like that. They come back and they do something that nobody would have expected a soldier to say. And they were like, no one ever spoke like him. How could we arrest him? Like, we've never met a guy like this. We, we, how, how, how can we arrest him? It would, be, it, it would have felt wrong to arrest him. We couldn't do it. Couldn't bring ourselves to arrest this guy. We, we were just in awe of him. I love that part of their answer. I love that kind of sense of who they are. And all I would say is if you're like these soldiers today, if you're listening to this and you, you hear about Jesus and, and it's intriguing you, it's even mesmerizing you, it's kind of leaving you to a point where you're like, no one talks like this Jesus. No one offers this kind of life that I've heard described today. No one talks about new spiritual life and new living water coming out of you. There's no one else who talks like this. This is unique and I, I'm amazed by it that I would encourage you, if that's you today, to make the next step, to pursue this Jesus to get to know him, to read more about his life, to talk to him, to, to pray to him, to, to realize that you can have a personal relationship with this one who gives you and offers you new life that'll satisfy your soul, that you wouldn't be content just to be sort of amazed and in awe of him to some degree, but you would pursue him and you would want him and you would see that he is the one who can bring you incredible, wonderful, new life in him. And that leads us then to our fourth group, our religious leaders. Now, as you see in verses 47 and following, they basically dismiss Jesus outright. Not all of them, we'll see that in a minute, but the vast majority of them don't even consider listening to Jesus at all. They ignore what he's saying. They're not interested in what he's saying. Their only grounds for not listening to Jesus or ignoring what he's saying is because no one else of their group has listened to Jesus. No other Pharisee or person of authority is believing in Jesus, so none of us should. Herd mentality. And they condemn Jesus, even though they haven't heard him or given, given him a chance to give his side of the story. I mean, this is really interesting. Nicodemus is one of them. He's the one, if you read the Gospel of John, who came to Jesus earlier in John chapter 3 at night because he didn't want anybody to notice, didn't want the other fellow Pharisees to see that he was doing it. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and has this interaction. And what does Jesus say to Nicodemus when Nicodemus is there? He tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. 
You need new life. And now these rumors of Jesus talking about being the one who can give new life and this living water that flows out of him, Nicodemus has some idea what Jesus is talking about, and he speaks up on Jesus' behalf and says, how can we, if we're following the law of God as we're supposed to, guys, how can we condemn Jesus when we haven't even given him a chance to defend himself? Great point. He's pointing out their hypocrisy. He's pointing out to the people who follow the law most religiously that they're not following it on this account, and that's a massive sin. It's really wrong. And here's the response that Nicodemus gets. Does our law, he asks, does our law, verse 52, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. In other words, who do you think you are? Are you from Galilee? Please, Nicodemus, who are you? And this is rather remarkable because Nicodemus was actually in that day known as one of the top Pharisees, one of the most well-respected. And they discount Nicodemus even as he tries to help them see that the path they're going down is actually a path that is dangerously a path towards death and damnation. And I think we need to understand this, especially those of us who are tilted towards religion and religious behavior. There's nothing wrong with doing religious behavior. Don't get me wrong. But here's what's interesting about what Jesus does so often in the Gospels and what we see happen in the Gospels. The people who are furthest from listening to Jesus, the people who are most resistant to Jesus are the most religious. And that should cause any of us pause to think that if I'm just being religious, then I'm going to be close to God. This is telling us over and over again that is just not true. You can be religious and you can be far from God because you can be religious and not have new life in you. You can be religious and not have the Spirit of God changing you. You can be religious and you can know all kinds of things, even about the Bible, and still not understand that you can have a personal, close relationship with the God who made you and the God who loves you. And so this, this word is a word of caution. A word of caution for those of us who might be tempted to just be religious, to know some stuff about God, but not really know Jesus not really know God as Father, not really realize the Spirit is the one who changes you and gives you new life. And so I ask a final question today. Do you know who you are? Are you, are you more like the religious leaders in the story? Are you like the soldiers, maybe? Are you like the people in the crowd who are struggling whether you really believe in Jesus? Or maybe are you like the people in the crowd who really do believe in Jesus? Because today, Jesus, in this passage, is saying these words to you. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he, by his spirit, will produce a living water that flows out of your heart and brings you new life and brings life to those around you. That is the good news of Christianity. Christianity is, in that sense, a supernatural, life-changing reality. Not a following the rules or going through emotions kind of activity, but it is a new living relationship with a God who loves us so much that he sends his son into this world, a son who dies for us, a son who when we put our faith and trust in him is a son we're united to in his death, united to in his resurrection from the dead, united to him in his ascension into heaven, united to him in that sense as reigning with him already now and dwelt in by his spirit that the spirit of God lives in you. If you are a person who's put your trust in Jesus, that you've repented of your sin and turned to him, the spirit of God lives in you. It's given you new life and that new life is producing in you change that makes your life characterized by the fruit of the spirit and causes as we live this out, causes people around us to experience that new life so they too can see the one who gives it. Not us, but God. Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's pray. Father, for those of us who are feeling like 
boy, I don't know if I have this new spiritual life in me today. I pray that we would turn to you, Jesus, and we would see that you're the one who forgives, you're the one who loves, you're the one who gives new life, you're the one who sends your spirit, that we can trust you, that you will do this work in us, that you can change us, even today. And for those of us, Father, who, who we know this and, and we know the actual spirit is in us and, and we know there's, there's some, but we're kind of cold-hearted, we're distant. I pray that today we would be reminded that you're the God who wants to work in us by your spirit so that there's a river flowing out of our hearts, that there's a real change, that people would see that change in us and they would see the wonder of who you are and we would be in awe of you and amazed by you and we would be led to worship you. And so I pray that your spirit would be powerfully at work Work in us by your spirit. Change us. Make us into people who truly have that living water flowing in us and flowing out of us that we might be agents of your new life, not in our strength, but in yours, not by our ability, but by your spirits, living for you and putting on display the new life that you have given us as a gift because of Jesus and all that he has done. And so, Father, we pray. Change us to be people who live this new life out, that rivers of living water would flow out of us who call ourselves Christians, that the world might see you and be in awe of you as we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.